This is Zestology. I'm Tony Wrighton. It's the podcast all about more energy. One of the themes that comes up a lot on Zestology is resilience. If you're someone that can develop and cultivate resilience, being able to kind of fight back through adversity, then that will help you with your vitality, your energy, your motivation, and your kind of purpose. And when disaster strikes, what do you do? How do you deal with it? Do you have resilience? Today's podcast features an amazing story. Seven years ago, Adam Greenberg was a baseball rookie. And in his very first... Now, this is the problem because I'm English and there's a lot of American terminology in baseball. But I think the terminology is at bat. So basically, the first time he played baseball in a big game, in a proper big game, his very first at bat, he went in full of excitement taking part in his first baseball game and instead of hitting a home run he got hit in the head hit in the head with the ball knocked out concussed and out of the league and that was pretty much it for his baseball career he was simply focusing on staying alive and he didn't know it at the time but that pitch that hit him in the head was a gift intrigued you'll have to listen to more amazing story of Adam Greenberg Um, And just before I introduce Adam, there is a special guest in this podcast as well. Adam's little boy, Leo, who pursues him through the house as we record the podcast, which is really sweet. Um, And Adam has a parrot as well. The parrot makes an appearance too. It's all going on in this podcast. So here he is, Adam Greenberg and Leo and the parrot. get underway properly do you think it's worth trying to explain the rules of baseball to people in england <laughs> <laughs> that might take a little while <laughs> um, um, i what about this this might be controversial with you what about it's like cricket but it's a bit less subtle <laughs> um okay i mean it's it, 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 here's here's how i describe baseball baseball is like the game of life you're going to be filled with highs and lows you're never as good as you think you are you're never as bad as you think you are and it's just a wonderful game filled with obstacles and challenges. And, um, and that's how I describe it. That's awesome. And do you know what? I actually, I've been to quite a few baseball games and my favorite sport is cricket. I'm a total cricket geek and I absolutely love it. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, that's cool. Awesome. Yeah. Um, but I still think that cricket lasts five days. I mean, you can't beat that. Just a whole game lasting five days. I mean, that is pretty awesome. Come on, admit it. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty cool. I think yeah. it's super awesome. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, and actually, yeah, we're just recording this. It's going to go out later, but we're recording it during the World Series at the moment, aren't we? And yep. um, I've been following this. It's been so exciting. And I think baseball's kind of undergoing a bit of a renaissance because we were actually in L.A. a couple of weeks ago and everyone was in bars telling us how important it is it's all quite exciting isn't it it really is i mean i think just with like anything uh it goes through highs and lows peaks and valleys um all sports do uh just like anything in life so i think what's really cool is to see this regeneration of uh, of interest in the game a little helper there as well (laughs) i've got my little man i apologize he's two years old and he's a baseball fanatic so (laughs) when we start baseball he gets excited yeah, I mean, he, he gets excited anything with uh, active or a ball, um, but he's uh, he's my little buddy. He's, he's almost two years old, and um, yeah, he, he, he does everything with me. Well, we will look forward to interruptions from it. What's his name? <laughs> his name is Leo. Okay, well, if Leo interrupts us, that's absolutely fine, and we will look <laughs> forward to it greatly. Um, awesome. Now, Adam, tell, tell us your story, because I kind of know it already, but this is what we've got you on. I'm really excited to hear about it. And it is an incredible roller coaster, isn't it? Well, it, it, uh, it, it certainly is. Um, <clears throat> my, my story started when I was five years old. I wanted to play Major League Baseball. And uh, out of eight million people that try to play every year, there's only 750 spots uh, at any one given time during, in the Major League. So the odds are certainly stacked against you to get there. 
Um, but I, uh, I wanted it so badly in my heart and in my mind, and I was willing to do anything it took to get there. Um, and I went to, uh, went to high school and ultimately got an opportunity to go to the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, uh, which is, uh, for me, may- maybe some of your listeners, uh, they might know Michael Jordan, the basketball player. Oh, yeah. So the easiest way to say uh, North UNC Chapel Hill is that's uh, where Michael Jordan went to school. Right. So... Uh, so I had uh, three great years at UNC Chapel Hill playing baseball and got drafted by the Chicago Cubs in the ninth round of the draft in 2002. Wow. Um, and at which point I started my minor league career and played in uh, in a small town. Well, actually, that's not a small town, but it's in the middle of nowhere. It's in Lansing, Michigan. And um, I was making $850 a month mm. and $20, $20 a day on the road for meal money. Um, but it was it was heaven. It was everything that I ever dreamed about wanting to uh, wanting to do, and that's play play baseball professionally. So, Leo's impressed by that bit as well. Leo's back. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, um, I I I chose that path and played and had some definite ups and downs uh, while I was while I was playing in Michigan, and then uh, started to to watch myself kind of progress a little bit in the system and. Uh, but three and a half years after I signed professionally, I got my opportunity with the Chicago Cubs in the major leagues and got my major league call up. So I was going to be one of the 750 people in the world playing major league baseball. So my dream officially came true. Um, I can call it getting drafted a dream come true, but really making it to the major leagues and getting that call up is, uh, is the ultimate dream come true. So uh, it was July 9th. 2005 of, uh, of halfway through the Major League Baseball season, and I got that call up, and, and that was my first Major League game, my first Major League at bat. I was pinch hitting for the Cubs, playing the Marlins down in Miami. Right, this, and is, this is your debut. This is my debut. Yeah, this is the very first, okay. very first day, very first pitch. Uh, it was a, a nationally televised uh, ESPN Sunday Night Baseball game, and in that first at bat, first pitch that I saw, the ball came. Uh, out of the pitcher's hand. He's a left-handed pitcher, and I'm a left-handed batter. Uh, and as the ball was coming towards my head, I was just basically saying to myself, well, don't don't, don't get out of the way in case it's a curveball and goes over for strike one. And I looked stupid in my first major league at bat. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and the ball didn't break, and a 92-miles-an-hour fastball caught me right up under my – my uh, right ear up under the helmet and uh, and hit me square in, in my head. So um, my eyes rolled in the back of my head, and I said two words three times, stay alive, stay alive, stay alive, and that was my introduction to Major League Baseball. Wow. So this, I mean, it really was. The first, was that the first ball that you faced? First pitch, yeah. Uh, wow. you, can't even, you can't even make it up. First pitch, yep. Yeah. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? So, so what? So, what happened then? So after that, um, as I mentioned, how many people try to play Major League Baseball? Um, once I got hurt, I became somewhat of a commodity. Um, I had positional vertigo and vision issues for the next two and a half years, all um, non-visual injuries. So, uh, so for those sports fans or anyone who's ever dealt with an injury. Um, if you have a cast on your arm or your leg or a brace or even a Band-Aid for that matter, people understand that there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Um, I didn't have any of those things. I didn't have any of those visual symptoms. Um, everything was non-visual. So it was a very, very challenging time in my life going through 17 doctors, being misdiagnosed over and over and over again uh, to ultimately get the the positional vertigo diagnosis, and then uh, it was about a year and a half later, uh, I got my uh, my vision checked. Um, uh, and sorry for... to interrupt, Adam. At this point, yeah. you're, you've not played since. Well, no, I, I I did play. I played 21 games after I was injured, and that was because the doctor said if I was 72 hours symptom free, I could go out and play for, for the and, major league team. Well. It was 72 hours symptom free and I could go back out and play. So what happens is in baseball, just to give uh, just to yeah. give the listeners a better understanding, there's the major leagues. That's where you're striving to get to. Yeah. Um, and then under the major leagues within the same organization. So I'll just use the Cubs as the easy example. Yeah. It's the major league baseball Cubs. That's what people see. That's what people talk about. And that's what's on TV. Mm. And then under that organization is the AAA team. 
That's the team right up under the majors. And then underneath the AAA team is a double-A team. Underneath that is a high A-ball team. Underneath that is a low A-ball team. Under that is a short season team. Under that is a, uh, sh- um, a rookie ball team. And under that, there's international teams. Right. So I give the backstory of understanding that to realize that just because you're playing professional baseball, it does not mean you're in the major leagues. And there's a whole lot of people within one organization striving for those 25 <laughs> roster spots on that individual team. Yeah, yeah, okay. So it's like the difference between the major league team is like Manchester United and the minor yes. league team is like playing for Yeovil Town or something. No, yep. no disrespect to Yeovil, but it's just not as big as Manchester United. It, it, exactly, and, and it's not. It, it's it's affiliated. So at any given time, you could be called up from that team, the, those those lower level teams. Um, but it's it's usually a process. So the youngest guys are on the lowest levels, and they work them way, their way up. And obviously, the more the skill level, then the higher they go. So the minor leagues is really it's kind of like going to school. You know, you, you go to school and you start in elementary school or pre-k and and then you go and you work your way up um and the more skills you acquire the then you graduate you get to the next level so that's kind of like it is with baseball so Um, so you you did play a few games after that injury once the doctor said you're okay but you weren't playing for the number one team you were playing for the yeovil town team you got it yeah yeah yeovil town (laughs) yeah poor old yeovil town they're quite good yeovil i've been there it's good uh, okay, so so then so then you get this diagnosis eighteen months later, and are you not playing as well in this time? Is this why you're still trying to get different diagnoses? Yeah, I, I definitely was not playing up to my caliper that I was used to, and what was what was frustrating is I really didn't understand why uh, I was putting in the same work and the effort, if not more. Um, and just really, really struggling. So it was, it was definitely a challenge. And some days I would be okay, and then the, the next day I would, all my symptoms would come back. My eyes would shift uncontrollably side to side. I was migraine type headaches. So it was, it was very detrimental to my, my psyche, uh, not yeah. just on the field, but was I going to be okay after, <laughs> after baseball, um, off the field. So it was, it was a very challenging time. And my, as you said, my, my statistics and the, the way that I was performing was just not up to my standards. And, and, and it really started to take an effect. Mm. And then, and then you got the diagnosis. Um, what did you say it was something concussion? Uh, sorry. Well, what? it was positional vertigo. Positional was the original. vertigo. Right. Yeah. And, and, and that was, that's a, it's not fun. I mean, you, equilibrium gets thrown off. Um, so balance and uh, visual, uh, how I was able to kind of see things. And if I put my head down, my eyes would shift uncontrollably or my head back. Um, and, and really what was the bigger issue was the fact that my, my vision, I mentioned, um, your eyes converge. So when a ball is coming at you, your eyes come to a contact point. Mm. So you see where the ball is. Um, and when you have to take a bat and hit the ball, obviously when your eyes converge on that ball and the contact point, that's where you expect it to be. Yeah. Well, I did some visual training in 2007 mm. just to check with 3D glasses and a remote control and found that my visual alignment was was 13 steps off the target, which means – where I thought the baseball was, it was 13 steps away. So, um, so it it was really eye opening. You didn't eye-opening. have a chance. I didn't have a chance. Um, yeah. yeah, not even. Not and, even and all the while, presumably the fans know you as the guy who's faced one ball and hasn't turned out for the for the team since. Um, for, yeah, basically, I was the guy, and I was accused of faking my symptoms because once again, you you couldn't see it. So, um, one, one of my managers specifically. Um, accused me of, of faking it. <laughs> so, so it was really to 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 not feel well and and try everything in my power to play, uh, and then to be accused of faking in a symptom is just like it's detrimental. So yeah. it, it took a toll. Yeah. And then, um, how did the story kind of play out after that? Did did you kind of come back to first team action or or what? No, it it took. Uh, I ended up going from the Cubs to the Dodgers. Well, Leo, the... Leo gets upset at this bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just right on, right on cue. Um, I went from the Cubs to the Dodgers to the Royals to the Angels to the Reds, um, the Orioles. Uh, played for a lot of different teams and, and it, all in the minor leagues and just kind of fight my way and claw my way 
um, just to just to get out there and do the best that I could. And it was in 2012. Uh, I ended up playing for Team Israel in the World Baseball Classic qualifying tournament. And at the end of that tournament, I got my uh, my second major league call up from the Miami Marlins. So the team that faced me, that knocked me out of the league, was the team that was. Uh, was giving me another opportunity to get back out there and uh, and get another shot. Wow! And and then did you play again? So I played and I had one amazing at bat um, with them in the major leagues and uh, I was nationally televised. I went on uh, a whole bunch of, of of national media outlets and uh, it was really really cool how everyone kind of took to the story. And I ended up striking out on three pitches, faced the uh, best pitcher in the league who uh, threw a knuckleball, which for non-baseball people, it's a ball that has no spin, and uh, and it just floats through the air. It's really, really tough to hit. See, the wonderful um, thing is, if you don't understand baseball, this is basically noise. But <laughs> but yeah. even so, I'm still enjoying the story because even though it's noise, I just love baseball, and I know there's a lot of little <laughs> quirks and traditions. So it, it sounds like a kind of redemption of sorts at this point. Yeah, it certainly was. Um, but, but really, my story is one that should should help motivate and inspire people. And and you really don't need to know what baseball is for that matter. Um, The little nuances make it sound cooler because you understand it, you get it. Um, But really life is, as I mentioned earlier, life is all about ups and downs and challenges. And and I gave everything to the game of baseball um, because I, I needed it. I wanted it so badly. And no matter what happened, how bad my life got and how things got in my way, I wasn't going to accept that fate i was i was going to make it back um and and that's ultimately what happened so so really uh, once again for your listeners that don't understand baseball at all um the reason that it's so important to me to share my story with everyone is because it's truly about uh never giving up and 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 not just keeping hope because hope is i i i want something i i hope to have it um, it's the willingness and a commitment to actually going out and getting it, and uh, and and not allowing the little obstacles to get in your way. So yeah. that's what that, that's that's what my story is really all about. Yeah, and you know you did play for the Miami Marlins, but really that was that was one game, wasn't it? And and it's, and your career was starting to wind down at that point. And I know that obviously now you've written a book, which I'm interested to talk to you about, and I'm interested to know. What are the specific things that helped you get through the dark times? Because one of the themes that comes up again and again on Zestology is when, when the good times are going, it's fine. But it's how you deal with adversity, and everyone's going to have downers as well as uppers, um, mm-hmm. how you deal with those moments. And you've had quite a lot of those. <laughs> to say the least. And, and that, that's, well, that's part of the other reason why I wrote the book is because <clears throat> in, in, in a short interview or when I give speaking engagements, even if I'm talking for an hour and answering question you know question and answers yeah um it's it's not the same i mean it's not to understand the depths of the things that i've gone through i guarantee i can connect with somebody on some level in just my 36 short years on this earth already just because i've gone through a heck of a lot um so so really what kept me going was obviously the inner burning desire to to accomplish my goal and and that's easy for me to say because i knew it i felt it and it was mine and i had to have it um but for for a lot of people it's it's they don't have that big overarching goal um but even though i knew that i couldn't get it today because it was very (laughs) if it was the off season or if i was in a hospital or if i was uh, not playing um, obviously it was not going to happen that day so the thing that kept me going was the little goals and the little things that i could do to to put myself in a better position um continue to grow continue to, to to get better as a as a person and as a player so i used those little things daily um, as my driving force to uh, to overcome the down times and and I kind of live my life by these three these three concepts. Concept number one: prove myself right, because whatever I do, I have to prove myself right because then I'm doing it for the right reasons. The second is proving the people that support me um, and and that give me give have given me their support. Um, give it to them, like prove them. That they're right also, and 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 do it to uh, do it to to show them that their support is for something. Um, and then the last one is is kind of that fuel that 
that keeps the the engine churning when it goes really dark and really down times. And those are the naysayers. Those are the people that don't necessarily believe in you um, or, or have doubted you. Mm. Th- th- those are the people that I I don't want to be right. Um, <laughs> I'm going to yeah. – that's going to be the fuel that keeps me going during the dar- darkest of times. Um, and, and I think it's really important to have those in, in that order because – if you use the last one as your driving force, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. If you're only doing it to satisfy somebody else's uh, wants and desires, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. You have to do it to to fulfill your purpose, and then follow the rest. Uh, the the rest kind of keeps you going. So that's just. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm saying that's how I uh, kind of live live. And during those times, I was making sure that um, that's why I kept going. So if people told me, "Hey, give it up. It's time to it's time to quit." That was my fire because because I wanted it so badly for me, um, and uh, yeah. and I think that's uh, I think it's important. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's sometimes if you think too much about the kind of the naysayers, the people who who would almost like to see you fail. There's something I know it's a bit of a kind of wishy washy concept, but the law of attraction would say that you're kind of focusing on the negatives and you're yeah. giving that too much energy. If you see what I mean. Yeah. But if yeah, that's absolutely. if that's a driving force. And then all the kind of positive comes come through, and you you obviously did it because you wanted it for yourself. Then then that's more positive, I guess. Yeah. So that's it. Um, so now I'm looking. Can I hear a bird cheeping in the background, Adam? Is it all going? <laughs> it's all going on in your house. <laughs> it is one fun, happy house. Yeah, yes, it really it's, is. Uh, yeah. Got a couple of parrots in the, uh, in the oh, back. So. It's all going on. <laughs> now, because I'm, I'm looking at the the. Um, the the book get up the art of perseverance and obviously you just talked about perseverance and the picture on the front cover presumably this is the moment when you got hit it's an incredible picture i just want to describe it it is the moment when you got hit isn't it correct yes 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 and you're kind of lying on the ground clutching your head and the other well in cricket he'd be called the wicket keeper but i don't think he's the wicket keeper i think he's the the the, the catcher Um, he's the catcher yeah catcher is kind of kind of bent over you in a kind of just trying to kind of I think trying to help you out as you clutch your head on the ground it's it's a very dramatic photo because it's clearly within a second of you having been hit by this ball at 90 miles an hour yeah it it is exactly that um my head my hands are clenched in my head and I thought that I was holding my head together because I I thought that it had split open and as my eyes rolled back in front of my head because they rolled they rolled behind me when they came back um the first person that i saw was the catcher so the 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 guy who's standing over me and in that moment it was when i knew that i was going to be okay because after i said those two words three times stay alive stay alive stay alive um i was very concerned that my head was split open i was bleeding out so once the um once the catcher said to me, stay down, you're going to be okay, it was that calming uh, feeling that came over me that basically allowed me to, 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 to relax for a second and know that I was, I was going to be okay. Mm. Mm. It's a really dramatic photo, isn't it? Yeah, I and mean, it's, it's, uh, we, we tried to figure out kind of what we wanted to put on that cover, and um, and that's that's kind of where the title comes in, and that photo just exemplifies everything because it was that moment that changed my life, and and hopefully has now affected uh, a whole lot of people's lives in a positive way. Mm. So, and you know, obviously, you talked about perseverance. I know there's a chapter in the book about never giving up, and mm-hmm. uh, that's a kind of a big theme of yours. Um, how, what's how's it all kind of panned out in terms of your life since I, I did a bit of digging before the interview and i think you've got have you, you've got an online supplement company now haven't you yeah uh i started a nutrition company about seven years ago uh i was injured during my journey to come back and i was introduced to nutrition and whole food nutrition uh as a way to heal and prevent uh, the body from breaking down and injuries and illness. Um, so uh, it, it became a part of my life, but in 2009, I dove for a ball and I snapped my rotator cuff all the way through. And, um, oh, I, and, and, <clears throat> I can't help thinking you're a bit accident prone. <laughs> well, it, it, if, if you do things long enough and you, you, you play a sport long enough, you're yeah. going to have things happen. And, and it's interesting because mine, my injuries were they just so happened to be rather serious um yeah. few and far few and far between um but 
it's it, it's part of it was part of my journey. So uh, when I tore my rotator cuff, when I give speaking engagements and I talk about it and I go through my whole process, and if somebody reads the book, they would understand. By that point in my life, <clears throat> um, that was a a clear moment of like, what are you doing this? Why was I still playing? Why did I even want to keep going? Um, and and that's where that inner burning desire to to make it back really came in. And 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 I'm really grateful for it because if I hadn't hurt myself. Um, I would never have been introduced to uh, it's it's the antler of a deer, uh, ground down and encapsulated. It's a whole food, um, and I was able to play three and a half months of professional baseball season with a ninety percent rotator tear and a labral tear, mm -hmm. and without any anti-inflammatory or cortisone or Advils or anything like that. I I, I played that season with just a, a whole food, um, so my results were pretty cool. And then I had surgery where I was supposed to miss 10 to 12 months and came back taking the supplement um, five months later. So I beat my rehab by 50%. And that's when my orthopedic surgeon started giving this to his patients, arthritis, bone on bone, tendonitis, chronic inflammation, and all, chronic pain. And it was cool because the orthopedic came back to me and said, his patients were thanking him and saying, where can they get more of it? So I kind of felt at that wow. point, it was almost an Is that um, almost a deer, deer antler? Is that now banned? Uh, no. Well, so our antler, what we use is actually the whole antler, ground down and encapsulated. Um, there is an, there's an, there's a hormone called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor. And insulin-like growth factor in its, uh, in its pure form is a banned substance, um, yeah. according to almost all sports. Well, in, in a piece of meat, in milk, in certain vegetable proteins. Yeah, I, I, I take IGF colostrum sometimes. That's definitely yeah. got growth factor in it. Yes, yes, exactly. So IGF-1 is, is definitely pre prevalent. Now, when you consume and ingest IGF-1 in a food form, it breaks down in your gut. So it's totally natural. It's a protein, and it's all good. When you extract it or synthesize it and alter the delivery mechanism, which means instead of eating it, you, you spray it or you put it as a sublingual drop, that gets into your bloodstream immediately. It avoids the digestive tract, the natural process for your body to break it down. So in that form, it's technically a banned substance. So that's why uh, uh, you're, the, the athletes who have a piece of steak in their locker are not going to eat a piece of steak and get suspended. So our antler is certified drug-free. Uh, we're the only antler product in the world that's certified drug-free. And it, it genuinely has everything that makes up your joints, your cartilage, and your bones. And it has anti-inflammatory properties. So wow. it's really, really powerful as a food. And it's not an overnight, oh, my God, my whole life is different. Um, but it certainly uh, takes effect over time and just continues to get better. So what, what the obligation that I felt was I want to help people. And I want to get this into people's hands. <clears throat> so I started the brand. I started the company, Lu Rong Living. And Lu Rong is L-U-R-O-N-G. And it's Chinese for deer antler. So, so yeah. it kind of, it kind of made sense. This is the first for Zestology, deer antler. I, I feel like <laughs> I have heard of it before. But, um, but definitely with the, with the growth factor, the colostrum that I've taken, I've taken it during spring. And it's helped with hay fever, weirdly. So, um, right. so I'm so I'm interested. I'm definitely interested. I'll, I'll have a look now. Um, I want to ask you, Adam. Um, what is one book that you would recommend? This is something I ask everyone. What is one book that you'd recommend, and one tip for living with more energy, vitality, and motivation? So, obviously, we've already been talking about your book, and we'll we'll give the links to that um, in just a, a moment or two. Um, but what other books have had an impact on you? It doesn't have to be the best book you've ever written, but one that's kind of had a bit of an impact on you. I'll, I'll give uh, I'll give two, and they're totally independent of each other. Um, <clears throat> one is called The Slight Edge, and it's by Jeff Olson, and it really depicts an unbelievable picture that is, and, and, and it's kind of the message that I like to provide is I'm no different or more special than anyone else. And it's truly saying that every single person has the ability to have success or have what they want or have what they uh, desire. Um, but 
everything has to be, it's, it's all about that slight edge. What, what are the decisions that you're making? Those little decisions that add up, it's not just one monumental decision in life change that, that really needs to take place. So it's very applicable to every single person that reads it, which is why I really, really like it. Um, <clears throat> that's one book. And then, and then another is more so from a, uh, from a business perspective, what I like uh, a lot and it's called raving fans. Um, and, and, being a uh, business owner um, and very customer centric, I mean, we really have to have a relationship with our customers. Uh, I've learned a lot from it because it really talks about separating yourself and, and the the term raving fan, that's what you want. Anyone who touches you or your business, your company, yeah. um, you want them to rave about you. So it really, it's just a, it's just a silly book, a fun, silly book that just, it's a story um, of a fairy godfather or whatever it is. Um, and, and it, but it really, it really kind of hits home where you're like, oh my God, uh, there's so much more that we can do um, with our customers to make them really, really just be excited about who uh, who we are and what we're all about. So those are two is it very different um, genres of books, but those are those are two that really have had an impact on me. Brilliant. And and just before we finish, what is one tip you'd give to people for living with more energy, vitality, and motivation? One tip for more energy, vitality, is it and motivation. Antler? Well, I, I was I, I wasn't gonna say deer antler so much. I, I, I certainly was gonna say um, so much of 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 life. It has to do with what we put in our body. Um, our body is an engine. So look at it. I mean, give me give me your favorite car, your dream car. What what would be the greatest car that you could ever own? Well, I'm I'm quite unique in that I don't know much about cars, and I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit of a kind of um, car idiot. I, I tend to refer to colors by cars by color. Um, but yeah, a nice red car, maybe a Porsche. Okay, but I don't really I don't really know. There why. you go. Okay, yeah. okay. So 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 Porsche, right? So so just understand that if you were to spend money on that car and you spent a lot of money on it, you would do everything in your power to protect it. You would put the best gasoline uh, or petrol or whatever you guys call it over there. Mm. Um, you, you guys would you, – you'd change the oil, put synthetic oil in there. You would make sure that you kept that car – pristine both inside and yeah. out not you know what i mean and and that's the thing with our bodies is our bodies are the most magnificent machines that we could have ever been given it's the greatest Adam, gift that we could now have... in the toilet <laughs> no <laughs> sounds no, like you're no, no. walking through the house you give me a little tour of the house as you talk i'm, I'm definitely i'm definitely walking through the house because i'm trying to walk away from leo because he's dragging <laughs> a, a tape measure through the uh, over the floor and it's dragging and making some it's, noise you so. know what it's been a real highlight actually being introduced <laughs> to leo and your parrots as well um it's been excellent um and it's been great fun talking to you as well um get up the Art of Perseverance is available on Amazon.com and on Amazon.co.uk. And uh, well, it's been really great to chat to you as well. I, I really appreciate you coming on Zestology. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tony. I really appreciate it. Bye, Leo. <laughs> he's, he's done. Put a fork in him. He's done. He's ready for his nap. <laughs> Well, it's always nice when my kind of two professional interests collide. Obviously, I work on a sports channel. That's the kind of day job and do this podcast as well. And they have collided today. Uh, nice to feature a, a sports story of resilience on Zestology. And thank you to Adam. Thank you for listening. As always, uh, Three Zesty Things is the newsletter that goes out every Monday morning. And you can head to TonyWrighton.com. It's Wrighton, W-R-I.com. Uh, sign up for that next week on Zestology something special because the most listened to podcast on Zestology of all time features John Gray the author of Men Are From Mars Women Are From Venus and it was a podcast we recorded about relationships uh, that is has been listened to so many more times than any other podcast I've recorded it's, it, it's amazing really and uh, John's in London, so I'm off to meet him, record a podcast, and John Gray is back, the most listened to Zestology guest, next week. Hope you'll join us then. Have a great and zesty week in the meantime. See you soon. <laughs>